This is similar to a continuance and could be done for various reasons if the board is not prepared to vote on a case. I want to stress that the ultimate decision to accept or reject the recommendation of this board is solely at the discretion of the governor. In addition, the governor is not required to act on a recommendation within a specific period of time. So with that said, I will call the first commutation case to be heard by the board today. That will be Ms. Gail Stallworth. On behalf of Ms. Stallworth, we have Mr. Willie Spain, who is Ms. Stallworth's brother. And we also yes. have Mr. Cornelius Harp, who is a lifetime friend of Ms. Stallworth. Yes. Are you able yes. to turn your, your cameras on, uh, Mr. Spain and Harp? Yeah, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to figure out what's wrong with it. My screen is at, on the fritz on me. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Yeah, I'm trying to get the screen straightened out. I'm being told that, uh, this is Mr. Harp, the host is blocked. Hold on a second. Okay, I'm there. Wonderful. All right, we can start with you, Mr. Harp, if you'd like to go ahead. Yes. Um, good morning. Um, Lieutenant Governor Fetterman, A.G. Sapiro, Mr. Gubernick Williams, Mr. Williams, and Ms. Grayson. I'm happy to um, represent Gail T. Stallworth in um, her commutation situation. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I will not be long. I will start to get up, speak up, and shut up. Um, of course, you all know Ms. Stallworth's situation. Um, she served three and a half decades so far, and uh, this commutation situation is fabulous for her. You know her um, her history as as being uh, incarcerated at CI Muncie, um, and you know her record. Um, over three and a half decades, she has had like just a handful of um, situations, handful of citations, whatever. Um, but she's been uh, uh, she could probably be the poster child for. Uh, inmates uh, at SCI Muncie um, and the whole with this whole deal with her being able to um, have keep commutation is fabulous. I'm sure you're concerned with what could happen and the potential of her growing outside of prison. Um, the work that she's done uh, in prison speaks for who she is. Um, she's a go-getter. Um, we've, we've set up, uh, her brother and I have set up various opportunities, um, work opportunities, um, volunteer opportunities. Um, of course, I know her from the church, Triumph the Church of King God in Christ, where she has tons of support there. We've put um, together a team of positive and motivating people that will... Um, look after her, make sure she's in a good headspace always. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm short and sweet, you know, um, we're just basically in a situation, we have a savings put up, put aside for her. So that's the whole financial thing. So in terms of her being uh, successful um, with your graces of uh, um, giving her a, a nod, um, and saying yes to this commutation would be fabulous. We're set up, we're ready to go, fired up, ready to go. And as I said before, um, you know, we're prepared for her to come out like a marathon run, runner, slow and steady as she's, there's more time behind her than there is in front of her. So we're set up so that she can win. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Spain. We can go ahead. Right. Well, uh, thank you, as um, Neil. You know, we've all been working in conjunction with each other, so I thank you for the opportunity for my sister to even made it this far. We've been separated since December the twenty eighth of nineteen eighty five. It has been a long road. I'm trying not to be emotional. Uh, I realize the severity of the crime, and um, you know. But at some point, we moved on, tried to grow beyond that. Uh, and I never would imagine that it would take all these years to keep my sister encouraged and uh, pressing on and pressing forward and reminding her that whatever we're doing, 
uh, guy once said that you start preparing to go home the day you come in. So you got to have that right state of mind when you first walk in there. And I know it's a culture shock and an adjustment. Um, um, even going back to the day I first got the telegram of what happened. And um, our parents died when we were five. So my grandmother raised me and my sister. Uh, we grew up in the church all our lives and worked in grocery stores. And my sister was going to uh, school to be a nurse. And uh, life happens. Uh, it's sometimes being associated with the wrong people, wrong place, wrong time. Uh, and never even imagined, and uh, you know, because we had such a small family growing up, but our parents being gone, that you know, I imagined one day, you know, I had nieces and nephews, and you know, that's that's gone out the window. All I have left is my sister. Both our grandparents are gone. Our one aunt is gone. Uh, three of our cousins have passed on. So it's really just uh, family-wise, just me and my sister, uh, and those few cousins around the country. But, you know, we have a host of people that we know from growing up in church. They just like our family because, you know, our lives were at church back then. But um, I've seen the things that my sister has done, the certificates and stuff that she sent me over the years. And uh, I always wanted her to know that, you know, uh, uh, life is beyond that point. Uh, you have to always be thinking that, you know, there's an opportunity, there's a chance to do better, uh, to get out and show people. See, I, I, I knew, I, you know. And so um, I'm just hoping that, you know, she really gets the opportunity after 30 something years uh, to just come out and uh, see what it's like to even be in the world as an adult. I think she was uh, 25 or 26 when all of this happened. And so the rest of her life has been in there. And like I said, I don't negate the severity of uh, what happened. Uh, but uh, I'm just asking that five people or the, whoever the people are part of the board to just give it every consideration, uh, you know, when you uh, sincerely sorry for all you've done, you try to do everything you can and hope that you've done enough, you know, and hope that, you know, the world just see you uh, different for a change. Uh, I don't want to talk you to death. I don't want to get emotional. I love my sister. I never would imagine because she's two years older than me. I thought she'd be taking care of me, but, you know, it turned out the other way. And I just thank God that, you know, he provided the resources and everything that I needed to, uh, be there for my sister all these years. And I would uh, love to be able to hug her again, be able to walk and talk somewhere again. And um, I just thank the board for, you know, giving me those moments to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. We also have um, the DOC representative. If the board has any questions for, uh, for uh, you, or if you'd like to have a minute to speak on behalf of Ms. Dalworth. I would like to provide a statement if I have the opportunity. Absolutely, please. Um, I'm just gonna synopsize a statement that I wrote for her. Ms. Stallworth is a 62-year-old first-time offender who arrived at Muncie in October of 1986 to serve a life sentence from Allegheny County for a murder second degree. During her almost 36 years of incarceration, Ms. Stallworth has taken advantage of program opportunities to address the poor decision-making that led her to incarceration, as well as other life factors, including trauma and loss, which had her as a 26-year-old looking for love and acceptance in the wrong places. Staff at Muncie described Ms. Stallworth as confident, optimistic, and self-assured, some of which um, the, those who have spoken for her also acknowledge. She demonstrates a genuine sincerity and remorse for her involvement in the loss of a life. Ms. Stallworth demonstrates her stability and maturity on a daily basis. She is cognizant of the importance of seeing the real person and not operating on blind trust, a concern which led to her current offense. When questioned on why she should be granted clemency, Ms. Stallworth is first to admit that she is not entitled to anything. She is clear about the impact her actions had on the victim's family, and she is genuinely remorseful for the part she played. Her hope is that the victim's family can forgive her not for herself, but for themselves. She is reminded daily of the actions which led to her confinement and her only hope is that she can continue to forgive herself and move forward by helping others. Ms. Stallworth has identified a concrete release and employment plan and is aware that her initial period of transition would be through a center in region three Pittsburgh area. Upon release, she's talked about her desire to relocate to either Maryland with her brother who has established himself as a productive member of society and a support for her, or to North Carolina with a childhood family friend where she describes a broad 
broad circle of familiar and or community support. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on her behalf. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, any comments or questions from the board? I don't have any, thank you. I do have a question. Sir. Um, is there any concern uh, given that, um, you know, it's now essentially been admitted that at least part of the motive for the crime was, uh, you know, this romantic relationship? Is there is there any concern that, you know, throughout the uh, throughout the documentation we have that 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 romantic relationship was was denied? And and that, you know, there was sort of a, you know, kind of a, a an inaccurate portrayal of of the connection between um, the applicant and uh, the accomplice and that that may reflect further um, uh, you know, kind of inaccuracies that might be in the record? Um, from our interactions here with Ms. Stallworth, I've not seen the conflict. I think one of the things um, to know is the gentleman that she got involved with had recently been released from prison at the time they met. She was unaware of that at the time. And he had a long history of robbery convictions prior to their involvement. I don't think she tries to minimize the relationship. I think it was one of those new relationships where she was trying to figure out what it was, if it was a relationship as she was coming out of a recent separation from her husband of, I think, approximately five years. Yeah. Just so I understand, did you just say that she was unaware that her accomplice had actually been discharged for, from prison during this time that she knew him? Is that, is that what you're saying? That is correct. She did not find that out until after um, they were arrested. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I, I apologize. I do have a question. Um, I guess my questions have to do more with you were at the um, interview yesterday. I'm trying to wrap my head around. Um, I cannot reconcile uh, the specifics of the misconducts while uh, Ms. Stallworth was incarcerated and her statements of it, it it appears that on one hand she's saying um that these things happened i didn't contest them i deserve what i had and the other side in looking at the information it states that she did contest them that she did minimize um her um involvement in the misconducts and it appears that a lot of things are, are minimized. And that's my uncomfortability at this point. Can you, do you have any insight on that? You heard all the questions yesterday. Um, what insight can you assist us with in that regard? Uh, kind of like I mentioned yesterday, I think um, you have to look at the span of time that occurred. I think as she's aged and she's processed the things that occurred back in her earlier years, um, I think she's come to terms with, yes, those were violations that, she sh that should not have occurred. What's not uncommon for us to see is at the time somebody incurs an infraction, um, they minimize behavior. Um, the interpretation of the information on the misconduct hearing report is the hearing examiner's interpretation of what was said. Um, but when you talk to her now versus I wasn't apparently wasn't here 36 years ago, but she does accept responsibility back then it was not uncommon for most inmates um, to kind of downplay their part in an infraction I did look at all her infractions, all of which were really non problematic inside the scope of a correctional facility, they were problematic in that it violated a rule. Um, but there was not a history of violence inside the facility. And that's what about the, I'm sorry, what about the March 3rd, 87 incident in the shower? That was very violent. How do you say that wasn't violent? Well, that occurred, if you look, within her first six months of confinement. And it whatever right. her, her and I have talked about that. And it was a relationship-based misconduct. Um, and since that time, she has gotten herself out of involvement in those relationships. It kind of goes back to that negative pattern of relationship building um, that she was experienced that led to her incarceration. 
um, and she was still kind of in the throes of those um, negative relationships. But since that time, she has established herself without those negative relationships. And I think that's what we've tried to focus on is, you know, that was in the first six months, and then she's stabilized herself and moved forward. And we've not seen those type of negative relationships with her, I can attest, 22 years. All right, thank you. I have no questions. Thank you. I have no questions. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to the next case, which is going to be case number two, Abraham Cruz, and we are uh, trying to Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, his his support is having difficulty getting in. Give us just one second. Okay, uh, we're still having some technical technical difficulties with uh, case number two, Abraham Cruz. So we're gonna move forward to case number three, which is Ricky Brockington. And on behalf of Mr. Brockington, we have his daughter, uh, Korea Murray. We also have Victor Clark, who is the brother of the deceased, who is gonna be speaking on uh, behalf of Mr. Brockington as well. Good morning, Ms. Murray. How are you? Are you able to unmute yourself? Hi, good morning. I'm finding yourself. Thank you very much. It's good to see you. You as well. You can go ahead with your statement. Um, well, I'm Ricky Brockett's daughter. Um, I just feel like uh, my dad has been like 40 years. I'll be um, 44. I really need my dad in my life. My children, my grandchildren need uh, my dad in his life, in their life. Um, I lost my son a few months ago. I just, you know, we, I just want to see my dad home. I, my dad has been there for me, although he's been incarcerated. Through college, he helped me with my math. Um, he he fast for me, and I know that's hard. Um, being though he's in prison, he fast for me when I took my nursing degree. Uh, I just really need that support from my father, even though I I got it from it, from there. I need him in the physical. Um, I see the growth in my dad. He's a strong believer. Um, I just think that it's time for him to come home and prove to everyone, um, not just to me himself, to prove to everyone that he's a better man than he was when he walked in. Um, my brother can't wait for him to come home. I know we, the family just, you know, I feel like my dad is a great man. I talk to him every day. It hasn't, a day don't go by without me talking to my father um, while in there. So some people ask me, how could you say your dad is the best of person that's in jail? My dad is the best dad that I know from jail. So, I mean, it'll be a great thing if 
you guys give him a chance. Thank you so much, Ms. Murray. Does the board have any questions for Ms. Murray? I do not. Thank you. Um, Mr. Clark, are you available? Actually, Madam Secretary, I do oh. have a question, but I oh, want to make sure we go in our Mr. Gubernick, Dr. Williams, you guys good? Yes. Yes. No questions. Um, Ma'am, I'd like to just ask you what your conversations are like. What What do you guys talk about generally? What 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 are your thoughts when you hang up the phone with him each day? Um, I'm always happy. Um, we talk about life. Um, he asks me, of course, the first thing he says is, how's his grandkids? Well, now I only have the one son left, so he asks me, how's his, you know, how's the grandkids? How am I doing? Um, cause I lost my son on his birthday. Mm. So I know that's hard. Um, it's hard for me. So he generally say like, you know, how's everything? How's, how's life? You know, um, can't wait to see you. Then I talk about my cooking cause I'm not a great cook. So he told me like, I'll taste your food. Um, I have three grandkids, seven months. Uh, six and eight, so he'll speak to them. Um, my oldest granddaughter, she always on the phone, like, hey, Papa. Um, it's just funny. He asked me how my sisters and brothers doing. Did you talk to your brother today? Although I'm his youngest, he asked each day, did you talk to your brother today? So it's, you know, I visited him, like, when business was, you know, open, I was there. So we, we talk about just life stuff, like, Right. He's engaged. Mom, he's engaged with your family. He knows what's up. Very much. Um, if my mom over, he'll talk to my mom, my mom, husband on the phone. He speaks to everyone, like all my aunts on my mom's side. If they're around or if I'm around, um, he speaks to my grandmother, he speaks to everyone. Okay. Um, we talk about God. He definitely talks about God. Um, he talks to one of my cousin Betty. She's like really, really into church and and they talk, they write letters. Yeah. Now you're gonna have you're gonna have a lot of responsibility if he gets the the opportunity for a second chance here. Gotta keep I'm fine with it. Focused on the straight and narrow. Are you gonna be able to do that? Oh definitely. I keep my big brother on the straight and narrow. <laughs> well he uh, he's a working man, but I have to call him like I'm big sis to remind him like you know, things. But other than that, I'm fine with it. I raised two sons. So I think I got it. So when the secretary follows up with you to say, how's it going there? You're going to be able to tell us it's all good, right? That's right. It's going to be all good. Okay. I know. Thank you. I'm Welcome. sorry. I'm going to cut you off. Were you saying something else? No, I know. It will be. Okay. Thank you for your time. Madam Secretary, I have no further questions. Thank uh, you. Lieutenant Governor, did you have any? I don't have any questions. I, I thought uh, Gen General Shapiro really had a very great question right there. I think we're we're all set. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ms. Murray. We appreciate you. Um, Dr. Welcome. Clark, are you available? I know you were having some difficulties connecting. Are you able to unmute yourself, Mr. Clark? All right, so it seems like Mr. Clark is unable to actually connect or um, unmute himself, but I just wanted to make a note that Mr. Clark is the brother of the deceased, and he was here to speak in support of Mr. Brockington's clemency application. Um, and so we will try to see if we can get some written support from him or if we can get him to come back uh, later and provide that testimony. Thank you so much, Ms. Murray. Um, I believe. Yes, and I believe we also have the district attorney's office on if the board members have any questions for the district attorney's representative. If not, we can go ahead and move on. I'd like to I'd like to hear from the district attorney if he or she has something to say. Or do, do they have a statement that they want to make or I believe they're just available for questions. Oh, just for um, questions. Okay. Sorry, my misunderstanding. Not a problem. Okay. If there are no questions from the board members for Ms. Boyette, we can move ahead. 
I have no qu I have no questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Murray, for your time. We're going to move back to case number two, Mr. Abraham Cruz. And we have Abraham Cruz's daughter, Yvette Cruz Maldonado, here to speak on his behalf. Good after good morning, Ms. Cruz Maldonado. Are you able to hear us? Yvette? Are you able to hear us or are you able to unmute? Okay, we might end up, we're going to actually call uh, Ms. Cruz Maldonado and uh, have her speak through the phone uh, since she's unable to connect. Okay, um, hopefully the board members can hear. Are you able to just introduce yourself quickly to make sure the board members are able to hear you? Hi, my name is Yvette Cruz Maldonado. Are you I'm able, to thank you. Board members, are you able to hear her? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Maldonado, go, go ahead. You can go ahead and start making your statement. Oh, I don't know where to start or where to begin. Uh, I guess just tell the board why you support uh, your your father coming home. Oh, I support my dad coming home. I think he did enough time for that time. I don't want him nobody in jail. Is there anything else you'd like to say on behalf of your father? He's a good guy. Wonderful. If the board members have any questions, uh, they can go ahead and ask. I do not. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we, we were actually able to get Victor Clark on the phone. Um, and so we're going to uh, move back to case number three, Mr. Uh, Brockington. So, um, Celeste, I, I do have questions for DOC regarding Mr. Cruz. So mm -hmm. I don't know if, uh, if this is the okay, time. Great. I'm going to put you on the phone in just one second. Okay. Uh, since, so yeah, we'll go, can we go, do you mind if we go back to Cruz and DOC just because since we have this, uh, the supporter on, on the line for Brock. No, that's quickly. totally fine. I just, I just wanted to register my desire to speak with them at some point. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, we can go ahead, ADA Boyette. Um, good morning, uh, members of the board. I have um, Victor Clark here on the phone. Mr. Clark, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Are you can able you to? Me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, are members of the board able to hear Mr. Clark? I'm sorry, what do you say? Yes. Uh, can, can everyone hear each other? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and I'm happy to serve as a go-between. Mr. Clark, we heard from um, Mr. Brockington's daughter, and, and then the board has called you to make any statement that you wish um, regarding this case and regarding Mr. Brockington and regarding your brother. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, shoot, boy, I, I heard his, um, was that his daughter or was that the talk? I believe it was his daughter. Oh, yeah. just, just for the purposes of the board, can you identify who this is and the relationship to this case, please? Sure. Um, my understanding, and I'll ask him to confirm, is that this is Victor Clark, the remaining uh, sibling of the victim in this case, Milton Clark. Mr. Clark, did I have that correct? That's correct. That's Thank correct. Thank you. Mr. Clark, you can go ahead. Yeah, I was listening to his daughter. Um, Give uh, 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 she, which, uh, express what she was feeling and this and that thing. And I, I can really appreciate where she's coming from because uh, I feel the same way. I miss my brother too so much, you know. But uh, at the same time, um, uh, I didn't know that uh, her, her, her father or brother was still locked up. 
you know, I, I, it's been so long ago, you know. But uh, me, myself, I have made some changes in my life, too. I'm now, uh, I got baptized as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And so uh, what the Bible, the sacred writing teaches us is that we should be forgiving and understanding, you know, because, you know, God forgive us and so we should forgive others. Uh, so therefore, my personal feelings and I think it should be released. You know, it's, you know, you know, you gotta, you gotta love and, you know, forgive and everything. And, uh, I feel as though that he, he may be genuinely, um, sincere and repentant and forgot about his past and, you know, just want another chance to start life over again. And I feel as though he should get that chance and that he should be set free. That's my personal feeling. I mean, the past is the past, you know, we hope people don't repeat the same mistake. God forbid, you know, but I'm supporting of uh, his being released. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Thank you. Does the board have any questions for Mr. Clark? I do not. Thank you. Questions? Wonderful. Uh, questions. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Clark. We appreciate your time. Okay, we can go back to uh, case number two, Abraham Cruz. I believe we have the superintendent from SCI Phoenix uh, to answer the questions that Dr. Williams has. Okay, um, so do, is there a statement or should I just, just ask my questions? There we go. Superintendent, do you have a statement on behalf of uh, Mr. Cruz or did you just want to answer questions? Can you hear us, Superintendent? This is Gary Olinger. I don't know if you can hear me or not. Yes, we can yes, now. We can Thank hear you. you. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm the programs manager. Yes. Uh, yes. Mr. Olinger, I, I have um, several questions, I, but I, I didn't want to uh, you know, speak if, if you had something you wanted to say first. I'm, I'm ready to answer the okay. question. Yeah. Okay. So my, my questions specifically have to do with the personality testing that was done for Mr. Cruz. Um, so in, in the, the commutation letter, uh, it was mentioned that, uh, you know, as is our standard practice, uh, there was personality testing that was completed um, there's, there's clearly, there's clearly a language, uh, challenge here. And it appears, it appears that, uh, as, as, as an attempt to mitigate that, that the questions were read aloud in Spanish to Mr. Cruz, but the results are invalid. And so I, I, you know, I, I wanted to sort of like have a little bit of a discussion about this because, um, you know, I, I you know, I, we're, we want to make sure that we sort of have valid personality testing on, on all the applicants. Yeah. yeah th this was considered invalid just because it was read aloud. That's not your, um, you know, the way you are supposed to do a, an MMPI, I believe it was in that case. Um, so, oh, really? You, you can you can use the information, but uh, it, you know to read it aloud is not the standard way of, of giving that test. But it was an attempt, I believe, on the, by the psychologist to to at least try to get some information, you know, from a, a personality test. Okay, so I'm I'm a li I'm a little bit I'm a little bit confused here because, like, the scores. I mean. The scores were not even reported, and so um, you know, I, obviously, this is an older gentleman who, in some ways, uh, presents a 
compelling case, but but we're sort of like flying a bit blind here. Um, so, uh, you know, so I so I think I think we could do this one of two ways. I mean, I, I was sort of expecting that the results were actually invalid here. Um, and then I was going to ask to, you know, to, to administer the Spanish versions of these, yes. although that presents an additional question of whether they're invalid because the English ones have been read, have been presented in, in Spanish, but it's kind of a different question. But it, do you have, I mean, like, do you have the actual tests that you can send to me or? Um. I believe we should have that. I don't have. I do not have them. The psychologists would have those if they're available. I can find that out. But yes, if we do, we could we could uh, send those. Um, I believe uh, Mr. Um, Cruz is actually illiterate in both Spanish and English, so taking a personality test like that would be you know would be difficult. And it may be that the the invalidity was actually because it doesn't explain it that well in the right. Report maybe based on the responses that he did give it, you know, that they still may have come out invalid. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of what I'm saying. So, I mean, this, this presents yet another degree of difficulty. I mean, if in fact he's just totally illiterate in, in every language, because then it, you know, I, I guess then it becomes a question of, you know, is it possible that he just cannot be tested, you know, um, yeah, the, the clinical impression with, with him over, over the years has been that he's considered what we call an A in terms of mental health um, stability, which is um, no mental health issues at all. Now, personality, um, from from this, I really, you know, I really can't say. Yeah, I mean, my per right. My personal concern, you know, in, in, in sort of hearing this story is that it, you know, the, the way that he recounted it literally did, did not make any sense to me. And so the personality testing becomes really important to sort of see, you know, you know, whether this is more of a personality type of problem that leads him to explain things in the way he does. Um, and as a practical matter, uh, you know, given his age, uh, perhaps it's, you know, less of a concern, but I'm just, you know, right. I'm, I'm just trying to make sure our process is standardized for all of our applicants. Um, so, so I guess, I guess maybe I'm a, you know, I, I, I think, um, I think that maybe what we could do, uh, I don't know, do you have an ability to reach out? To, I mean, I could email him, but do you have an ability to reach out, out to Dr. Malashek to see if he could send over the results that you do have? Yeah, I can do that, or I, I can also contact our um, licensed psychology manager at Phoenix. They may have the results right there. Okay. Yeah, that would be great, and uh, that at least maybe that could begin to sort of clear up what is admittedly a uh, potentially confusing situation. And we can look into if there's other personality um, tests that we can, you know, give that would uh, actually be uh, more valid in a, in a case like his. Exactly. Yeah, that, that would be huge. But we'll discuss that and, yeah, and get it to you. Okay. Thank you so much. That, that's all I have, Celeste. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. Any other board members have questions for DOC regarding Mr. Cruz? I do not. I don't. Thank you. I Wonderful. Don't. Thank you, Mr. Ollinger. We appreciate you. All right, we can move on to the next case, which is Charles L. Coley. On behalf of Mr. Coley, we have um, his longtime friend, Mr. Freddie Knowles. And then we also have Ms. Helen Hansberry, who is a friend and home provider. Uh, do we have Mr. Knowles and uh, Ms. Hanberry available? Wonderful. And then we'll also have the uh, DA representative available for questions as well. And if there's anybody from DOC that would like to say anything. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. All right. Good morning. We can go ahead and start with you, Mr. Knowles, if you'd like to go ahead. Oh, I believe you're muted now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm so sorry. My name is uh, uh, my name is uh, Freddie Knoll. Um, 
Uh, I was a juvenile lifer. I was a friend of uh, Mr. Charles Cooley for over the 49 and some odd years I was incarcerated. Um, my relationship with Mr. Cooley was uh, very familiar. Uh, I, I watched him uh, develop and grow uh, during, his, during his many years of incarceration. Uh, I know him to uh, have the respect of the administration almost from the time that he came in until the time that I left. Uh, the last nine years of my incarceration was uh, profoundly uh, somewhat intimate with Mr. Uh, Cooley as we uh, got were involved in programs. I know him to be uh, one of strong faith. Um, I know him to be a, a, a care, a very caring person for those uh, in his uh, incarcerated community meaning uh, educationally, spiritually, and socially, he uh, was very involved in being able to give back to uh, his internal community. Uh, my opinion of uh, Mr. Cooley and my coming on to champion his release is, is, is a belief that uh, his, his remorse for the things that happened early in his life have been demonstrated through his growth and development while in prison. As I said, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, confident that he had the uh, respect of uh, staff. I watched that over the, over the years of uh, my involvement with him. I knew he had the respect of uh, his peers, uh, those in his religious community, those in his uh, social and educational community. And I knew he had a strong family uh, connection. I didn't know his uh, his sister and, and them personally, but I knew that uh, he had frequent uh, contact with them. Uh, he was their he was their primary source for one sister whose husband died, and uh, Charles had a, a very close relationship with his brother in law, and was there consistently uh, supporting his sister during the time of uh, her loss. Uh, I would say that um, as much as uh, Mr. Cooley had an influence on his, uh, the, uh, his peers, uh, his influence on me was one of uh, profound uh, service uh, to our community. When I, I got out of prison, one thing that I uh, could not um, wait to do was involve myself in looking back on some of the people that I, uh, that were basically family for all the time that I spent. And uh, I had Mr. Cooley's support in doing that along with uh, his, his significant other, Ms. Hensbury. So, um, you know, my, my being here today is, is primarily to ask the board to consider uh, Mr. Cooley's uh, remorse for what he's done through, his, through the demonstration of his growth and development and how he has moved himself in a position to be helpful to others. That, that's, I think that's been the most significant uh, growth and development and change in his life or transforming his life is uh, uh, having a spiritual uh, base for uh, what he does, uh, having um, a deep concern for those who are lack of privilege, lack of privilege and opportunity, and where he knows that he uh, is capable, you understand, of uh, giving people a different perspective of what they can achieve, even even under incarcerated uh, circumstances. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Knoll. And now we have Ms. Hanbury. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, I hadn't prepared anything to say. I did submit a letter and I wanted to be here in support of, of Charles and in case anyone had any questions. Um, I am 100% confident that if given a second chance that Charles will use his time to help others and to try to make a difference. Um, he um, has certainly shown the qualities of uh, integrity and um, 
honesty and really wanting to help others. And I am just here in support, as I said, of, of um, him that he be given this, this opportunity. Thank you very much, Ms. Thank Hansberry. Um, do the uh, board members have any questions for either, either Mr. Noll or Ms. Hanbury? Uh, Ms. Grayson? I do not. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Williams? No questions. Thank you. Member Gubernick? I have no questions. Thank you. Attorney General? No, no questions for them. I'm curious if OVA has anything to add on this case, but uh, we can come back to that. Sure. Um, and Lieutenant Governor Fetterman? I have no, I have no questions. Thank you. Um, Attorney General, did you want to speak with a, a member of OB, OVA right now, or did you want to um, get the written in, uh, input? Uh, I'd like to know if there's any input. It seemed unclear from the record. Um, maybe the DA's office had some contact, but I, I rely on OVA, so I'm curious if they had anything here. Okay, Attorney General, we'll make sure we get that information from you. We don't have, um, OVA is not in right now, but we'll make sure we um, give you the opportunity to speak with them on that. Okay. Has OVA been present for these public hearings? Yes, yes. I just don't believe that we have. Oh, I'm sorry. It looks like uh, we just had checked the victim spreadsheet. There's no victim input in this case. Was there outreach? Yes. By and OVA. I can. Yes, by OVA. We can go ahead and also send you that spreadsheet. Um, I believe it was uh, sent around uh, by OVA a couple of days ago, but we'll make sure you get that information to uh, to show Thank their due diligence there. Thank you. Of course. Any questions for uh, for DOC on Mr. Coley? I do not. Any other board members? Dr. Williams? Oh, uh, no questions. Okay, Member Gubernick? No questions. All right, Attorney General Shapiro? No, thank you. Wonderful. Lieutenant Governor? No. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. We're going to move on to case number okay. five, who is David A. Johnson. And on behalf of Mr. Johnson, we have uh, his son, Daishik Jones, to speak on behalf of him. And we also have Larry Miller, um, who currently works with Nike. No, thank you. Mr. Jones, are you available? I see Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller, if you want to go ahead and give your statement, that would be great. Um, okay. um, <clears throat> good, good morning. Uh, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, show my support for, for Mr. Johnson. Um, I, I'd, I'd like this morning to uh, maybe quickly touch on, on three yeah, things very, very quickly. Um, the first one is I want to talk a little bit about myself, my experience, and, and who I am, uh, and the experience that I've gone through as far as uh, my involvement in the criminal justice system. Uh, from the age of like 12 to 30, I was in and out of jail, um, involved in a bunch of criminal activity. Uh, the last time I was in Miller, can I ask you just to suspend for one second? Um, I'm yeah. sorry, there's all kinds of I, feedback, and I want to hear Mr. Miller's. Absolutely, question. yeah. Um, Mr. Love, are you able to make sure that you're muted? I will do that. Thank you. Thank you. And then Mr. Jones as well. If you're able to make sure you're muted, that would be very helpful. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I still hear that 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 feedback, Mr. Miller. Are you muted? I. I oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Not Ms. Mr. Miller. Mr. Jones. Okay. Perfect. All right. I'm sorry. You can you can go ahead and proceed, Mr. Miller. Okay. Um. So, uh, from the age of like 12, 13, up to 30. Um, I was in and out of jail, uh, involved in a bunch of criminal activities. And um, the last time I was incarcerated was at Greaterford uh, Penitentiary. And there was a program there uh, where you could get involved in uh, taking college classes and live outside the jail, actually in trailers outside the jail wall. 
And uh, I got into that program, uh, got my associate's degree while I was there, uh, involved in that program, transferred down to Temple University, got my uh, bachelor's degree from Temple, started working for Campbell Soup Company. Um, and over the years, I ended up getting my master's degree, uh, worked for a number of different companies, including Nike, um, including the Portland Trailblazers as president yes. of Trailblazers. And I, and I think, um, you know, from where he's sharing my story and my past oh. is that uh, I think I'm an example of the fact that someone can change their life. Someone can, uh, with given the right support, given the right um, uh, opportunities, given the right training opportunities, all those things, I think a person can absolutely change their life and become a, a con contributing member to society. And so uh, that, that, first I wanted to talk a little bit about myself and share my background. And then um, when I was incarcerated the last time, I got to spend a lot of time with- uh, I guess with when they used to call them. And I could tell and see uh, and have seen over the years, have stayed in touch with him over the years and seen his progress in terms of uh, the number of programs that he's been involved in, the things that he's been doing to actually improve himself. And, you know, one of the things that I, I believe and I've learned is that um, in order for someone to change and to really move on and do something different with their life, they have to, uh, they have to actually believe it and it has to be inside of them. It's really what's in their heart. And I, I know for a fact that Mr. Johnson in his heart is a changed person. Um, I know for a fact that uh, he's not going to get involved in any other uh, cr criminal activities. And I think he, he absolutely wants to come home, spend time with his family and be able to give back to the community. And so, uh, so I, 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 again, 100% um, believe that he is ready to come home and that he is, uh, if this, this board is willing to to grant him, uh, you know, clemency, that he will be someone who's going to contribute to to his community. And the last thing I want to talk about is the fact that uh, he's got an incredible support system, whether through his family, his community, uh, his his the, the mosque. He's got an incredible uh, support system, and I personally, I'm committing to supporting his him once he gets out. That I will be there, however he needs help, whatever support he needs. Um, I will be there to, to help and support and give it to him because uh, I, I'm 100% confident that he is going to, like I said, be someone who comes out and contributes to the community and, and uh, makes a positive effort to, to do everything he can to help uh, help folks like him, whether it's veterans or, uh, you know, other folks. One of the things that uh, with his support, um, I've sponsored uh, him in a program called Mothers in Charge. And basically he will be trained and be prepared to work with that organization and help and support other people who are coming out or maybe stop some of the young folks who uh, who potentially would be going down that path. Maybe folks like Mr. Johnson can help stop some of those folks from going that, down that path. Um, and uh, so, so again, like I said, I, I, uh, I'm here to support him and will absolutely support him in any way I can uh, if you were willing to grant him clemency. Thank you so much, Mr. Miller. We appreciate your input. Any questions for Mr. Miller from the board? Mr. Miller, uh, good morning. I'm just curious how long had, um, I know you said you were in trouble um, until about age 30. Did you, uh, how much time did you spend in being incarcerated? So over that time period, uh, when I was 16 years old, I was arrested for gang related homicide and I was charged as an adult sentenced to four and a half to 20 years. Fortunately, I didn't receive a life sentence um, and I was able to get out. I got out, um, stayed, got involved in some other criminal activities, ended up going back to jail for a number of armed robberies the last time and ended up doing almost five years that, that time period. So I, I did two pretty long stretches or five year, almost five year stretches. And then within there, I did a year here, six months here. So um, during that time from, from from 12, 13 to 30, the majority of that time was spent incarcerated. And when was it that you encountered Mr. Johnson? When I was incarcerated the last time, he was there with me, and I got to know him very, very well during that time period. Okay, and... Um, it was in the, in the uh, mid-70s. Okay, and um, what 
uh, you said you got to know him very well. Um, what, if any, um, knowledge or skills did he impart to you? So one of, one of the things that I, I credit Mr. Johnson for, uh, that him and a lot of the other people there really encouraged and supported me in my efforts to get an education. And uh, he was one of the people that was really encouraging and that really helped to convince me that by taking the path that I was taking, that uh, that I would be able to change my life. And I, I know he has been involved in numerous programs and has been doing everything he can to better himself as a person. And, and I, like I said, I'm 100% I'm confident that he is a better person than he was when he first got there and that he's going to be someone who looks to contribute and, and add to society once he gets out. Thank you. I don't have any additional questions. Wonderful. Dr. Williams, do you have any questions? No, I, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Member Gubernick? I have no questions. A.G. Shapiro? Thank you. And the L.G.? I okay. don't have any. Thank you. Thank you. We can move on to uh, Daishik Jones, who is the son of Mr. Johnson. Mr. Jones? Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Daishik Jones. I'm the son of David Johnson. I'm the youngest of five children. Um, my father and I have uh, we have a very special and uh, unique bond, and we're very close. We talk often. Um, I used to visit him almost all the time uh, before the pandemic, uh, and I've spent the past 45 years waiting for this opportunity. Um, my father's been incarcerated since I was six years old, and it's been rough. Uh, I've I went from a kid, I was pretty athletic growing up, um, really good in sports, I played college football, and some way I still found that way to get in trouble. And uh, I remember visiting my dad one weekend, and a few months later, I was in there with him. And that was, uh, I never seen my father that disappointed in my life. Um, but something good came of it because I was only there 30 days with him, but within those 30 days, I got to learn so much about my father that uh, I never wanted to ever disappoint him again. In fact, it motivated me to become the man I am today. Um, I coach high school football. I mentor thousands of kids throughout the last 10 years. Um, in fact, I've just been invited to a, a a graduation, one of the kids I mentor uh, is graduating from the police academy September 16th. And uh, it's, it's because of my dad that I've seen the impact that not only he's had on me, but many, uh, many people who've come across his path. My father has uh, been a, a, a concrete guidance um, in doing the right thing and uh, making an impact and changing lives. Um, my mother, uh, my mother, uh, they've been together for over 50 years, married for 45. I've, I've watched my parents grow old and, and um, now they're dealing with health issues and some of them very serious. My, my mother has uh, not one but two brain tumors, uh, but she continues to hold the family together with honor and grace. Uh, my father is 76 years old now, but I, uh, uh, he still has so much to offer society. I promise you that. Uh, um, <sighs> my father will always remind me that life is a marathon. And you should live it with patience and compassion. And all that is good, you should pay that forward. It took me a minute to understand what he was saying, but I finally get it now. And I, uh, I read this quote, it said, life without liberty is like a body without spirit. And my father's spirit is alive and well. And uh, I, I pray that y'all find it in your heart uh, to grant him commutation so he can prove it and uh, make a positive impact on society. 
and uh, he has plenty of support, as you as you heard from Mr. Miller and and countless other people. Uh, he has employment waiting for him. Uh, my father, everything is set up for him to succeed out here, uh, and I promise you, he won't disappoint you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jones. Uh, do the board members have any questions for Mr. Jones? I do not. Thank you. Dr. Williams? No questions. Mr. Gubernick? I have no questions. Thank you. A.G. Shapiro? No, oh, Mr. Jones, <clears throat> thank yeah. you to you, Mr. Miller, for your uh, testimony here today. You're you're putting yourself out there here for Mr. Johnson. So. You know, you, you're going to potentially have some real responsibility here to make sure he stays uh, on the right path. Are you prepared to meet this moment and, and this significant responsibility? A absolutely. Um, I, I've never done this before in terms of uh, lending my support to someone at this level. Uh, and I'm, the reason I'm doing it for Mr. Johnson is because I'm 100 percent certain that he's never going to get in any more trouble and again that he is going to uh come out and be someone who actually looks to make a contribution to his community so i'm 100 percent willing to take on the responsibility of uh, of supporting him and and being there to help him in any way i can let me ask you a question you're presumably 100 percent certain that you're never going to go back on the inside right absolutely okay. And that's presumably because of a particular characteristic, feeling, emotion, whatever you want to call it, um, in yourself. Do you believe that Mr. Johnson possesses that same spirit, skill, trait? You know, you, you, I don't want to put a word in your mouth, but why don't you respond to that? Yeah, I, I, I absolutely do. And, and, and you're, you're, you're right. To me, um, for someone to really change and for someone to really uh, move beyond the situation that they're, they're currently in and that I found myself in, it really does take a change of heart. You really have to believe in yourself and believe that you can change. And and again, the, the communications and the interactions I've had with Mr. Johnson, there's no doubt in my mind that he is a different person than the person that, that walked into uh, to Greaterford Prison 40 plus years ago. Okay. Thank you. Lieutenant no Governor, any questions? Well, I, uh, my sentiments uh, mirrors uh, uh, General Shapiro's, so I don't have any questions. Thank you. We also have Angus Love, who is the attorney for Mr. Johnson, available if there are any questions for him, or if uh, Mr. Love, do you have any, a quick statement you wanted to make? I would like to make a statement. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on Mr. Johnson's behalf today. I've known him for over 30 years. Uh, I'd like to just say that in 2003, former Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy challenged the legal profession to examine the fundamental fairness of the efficacy of our criminal punishment system. A report, followed the a report came across the following year and included a chapter entitled The Need for Contemporary Pardoning Mechanism. It said there is a need for a safety valve under extraordinary circumstances to reduce the mitig or mitigate unfair sentencing schemes. Pennsylvania has such an unfair sentencing screen, screen, scheme excuse me, in its felony murder rule where the perpetrator of a homicide and his associates often get the same sentence, i.e. life without parole. I've seen district attorneys go to great lengths to, in charging decisions, but to ignore the back end of their sentences. The Pennsylvania Board of Pardons has risen to Justice Kennedy's challenge and revitalized re a long dormant pardoning process and given many people a second chance. David Johnson is a person that is worthy of such a second chance. He served our country honorably in Vietnam and was decorated with 10 medals, including two bronze stars for, quote, heroic and meritorious achievement against an armed enemy. He was honorably discharged and given a lifetime disability due to his exposure to Agent Orange and PTSD. He did not respond well when he returned to Philadelphia after his service and engaged in, in criminal activity for a 10 year period, culminating in the horrific events of January 19th, 1977. After finishing his shift at the dry cleaners 
and getting a haircut, some friends asked him to give him a lift in his car to Taylor's Variety Store in North Philadelphia. Four entered the store ostensibly to collect the debt. Two went into the back of the store while David and the others stayed in the front. Shots rang out shortly thereafter, and his two colleagues returned from the back of the store, rifled the cash register, threatened employees, and departed in David's vehicle. One had shot and killed the owner of the store, George Lewis. While accounts of these uh, events uh, are not consistent, as Dr. Williams pointed out yesterday, two facts remain undisputed. David had no prior knowledge that a homicide was about to occur and was not in close proximity to that event. He expressed remorse yesterday in the inmate interview for the day as he spoke Counselor, to the board. Counselor, respectfully, we, we have the file. If, if there's anything unique you want to add to help this board, please do so quickly. Okay, I will do so. Just want to note that he has been very active with, with veterans uh, at Braderford and with the Philadelphia Veterans Court. Uh, I have submitted seven letters uh, of recommendation. Uh, his son, who's just spoke eloquently, and, and Larry also submitted letters, as did Senator, State Senator Sharif Street, Dorothy Sprague Johnson in charge of mother, Mothers in Charge, uh, Veterans Court Timothy Wynn, and finally, uh, District Attorney Philadelphia District Attorney Frank D. Simone uh, submitted uh, a brief letter, uh, number four in the package, uh, that he offered, indicated that he offered Mr. Johnson a sentence of six or eight years to 20 years, which would have been appropriate under the circumstances, but it was rejected. As this letter had come from a third party, I contacted Frank to authenticate the document, and he indicated to me he had written it two weeks ago on July 20th and addressed it to Lawrence Baselli, uh, Johnson's criminal lawyer. This is a classic case of the felony murder rule gone awry, and we ask you to correct this injustice and give David Johnson a second chance. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Love. We appreciate that. Um, any questions from the board for, uh, for Mr. Love? Wonderful. Well, Governor, this concludes the public hearing portion of the 10 a.m. session of the Pennsylvania Board of Pardons, and we are now adjourned.